once sex was strictly rule governed. Now casual sex is a default option. And even publications like Teen Vogue run features on BDSM and anal sex. Yet large surveys in the UK and the US have found actual sex in decline across all age groups and millennials twice as likely to be having no sex than their parents at the same age. Is the decline in sex the disturbing outcome of our inability to form relationships in an internet age that has supposedly made it so simple? Or is this a positive sign that sex toys and porn are liberating us from unfulfilling sex? Might the future of sex even be outside of our primary relationships together? To help us navigate our way through, we're joined by Ella Whelan, a political commentator, freelance journalist and author of What Women Want, Fun, Freedom and an End to Feminism. Olivia Fain is a writer and in her most recent book, Why Sex Doesn't Matter, she addresses the politics, the obsessions and the misconceptions of sex. Soma Ghosh is a cultural critic, performer and founding editor of cult polysexual magazine, The Demented Goddess. We're going to ask each of our speakers to set out their stall, to have a, a pitch, if you like, and they'll get three minutes each. So the question we're asking them to address is, is there a right type of sex life? And I'm going to ask Ella to kick us off. Thank you, um, Sean. In short, is there a right kind of sex life? Broadly, no. Uh, but I think that we're being increasingly told that there is a right kind of sex to have and that there is a right kind of or uh, moral kind of sexual life to inhabit. Uh, and I think that's an entirely negative thing. I think in many ways, uh, especially for young people, um, the idea of what constitutes a good and healthy sex life looks more and more like a kind of a puritanical, almost Victorian view of sex, um, of something that has to be quite heavily policed and quite heavily fraught with um, worries and concerns and pressures. And I think that's a, a very negative thing. I mean, it's fascinating that surveys all up from all different kinds of places, BMJ and more informal ones, show that millennials are having less sex in particular. And obviously, in part, I think that can be explained by some very obvious things, like there are less pubs and clubs open, social life and meeting in bars has changed. Um, obviously, the advent of technology and dating apps and all the things has their knock-on effect. But I think actually it's a, it's a much more important an issue is the fact that we are talking about sex, seeing sex more often than ever before. It's everywhere and it's not just kind of in magazines and on billboards, but it's in school. It's uh, parents talk about it to their kids. We're much, much, much more open uh, about sex. And yet we're not having, seemingly we're not having as much sex. And for women in particular, I think the reason why this is happening is that, and this is what I go into in the book, What Women Want, that a contemporary feminist politics is, I think, really kind of stirring up a huge amount of fear around sex, treating sex lives, especially for women, as very troubled, dangerous places that are to be approached with caution rather than an exciting part of uh, adult life whether that be you know scaremongering um, about so-called rape culture on university campuses in the UK and America um, a broadening idea of what sexual harassment constitutes beyond any kind of sensible recognition um, or also this kind of obsession with consent in a way that doesn't reflect reality but actually problematizes the possibility to have any kind of sponsor spontaneous or enjoyable sexual experience without worrying about whether you're literally breaking the law. And I'll just finish on the point that I think the most depressing part of this for me is that I think women lose out on this most because it is our sex lives that have already always been historically scrutinized uh, and continue to be scrutinized, in fact, by cam political campaigns and, and policies which claim to be uh, speaking in our favor, feminist or otherwise. You know, the push for consent classes means that it takes away the agency of a woman to be able to, uh, you know, know and understand what her lines are without having it dictated to by some kind of person in officialdom. That I think the obsession with um, 
self-pleasuring there's other words for it that I'm not hip enough to mention but uh, masturbation with kind of being alone with yourself and self-care as it's called that I think is incredibly alienating and also puts a lot of pressure on uh, women to not be able to experiment and I think they've uh, in some ways ironically the massive push to destigmatize sex and just have it talked about ad nauseum has maybe taken some of the fun out of it um i think that in really my sort of thesis has been i think if we leave people alone more about sex it might mean that we start getting back together and getting it on because i think we're too much in our own individual sense of what we consider a sex life to be and not going out there enough and experimenting with real sex and real sex lives thank you ella so politics the politically right sort of sex puritanism and pressure Olivia, is there a right type of sex life? This is the right type of sex life. Two 15-minute periods of sexual intercourse per week, nothing beyond the missionary position, and nothing which might incite lust or transgress God's purpose to have very large families, thus recommended the Victorians in their sex manuals. We laugh at them. We're quite sure the Victorians were wrong. Our own language is quite different. We believe in the freedom to sexually express ourselves. No right type of sex life for us. We are true to our desires, true to our feelings, our fantasies. We are so free. Yet are we? Are we really free? The social obligation in this to have a really great sex life filled with danger, excitement, spice, to prove that we are not repressed or frigid, to prove that we are exciting people, is as harsh as any stipulation by the Victorians. So it turns out that even though we say there isn't a right type of sex life, actually it turns out there really is. And if you're not having bucket loads of pleasure, then you're a failure. My father-in-law was a painter. I once asked him why he barely used the colour red in his painting. He told me that the colour was so bright it distracted from the beauty of the other colours. Sex is like the colour red. It draws us in like a magnet. Our eye irresistibly rests on it. And because it does, we moderns have given sex meanings it simply doesn't have. Perhaps there are couples watching this who want to argue with me. Sex is an expression of love, they say. Sexual pleasure is a really important part of marriage, of life. If you are such a couple, oh my goodness, how I looked for you before I began researching my book. I was humble before I began researching. I promise you, I did not know the answer. I did not know, I needed to know. I wanted people to show me how sex and love really fitted together, or even why pleasure mattered. Why does pleasure matter? It seemed weird, but I wanted to learn and I was humble. The first time I interviewed a couple was not good. It was informal, they were friends, not close friends. They came for a, a summer dinner and I looked at them in the eye and I said, for example, what does sex mean to you two? The woman immediately answered, love, of course. And the man answered, alas, simultaneously and with equal enthusiasm, release. They began to argue. Are you going to tell me that sex has never meant more to you than pleasure? It's just a bonk, it's just a shag, it's nothing spiritual in it. Is that, is that really, really what you feel about our nights of sex together? Is that really what you feel? She said, there was no placating her. Two weeks later, they separated. But is that rather sad story exceptional? Doesn't sex mean something entirely different to every one of us? So, but 
Is there a right type of sex life? Well, the whole phrase, a right type, um, smacks of approval, doesn't it? When we say that somebody is the right type, we mean that they are one of us. Um, and what we want to do generally uh, with the, the, the kind of fanfare and shock around these surveys is to flatten and categorize sex um, so that it fits a model that is productive. Um, productive sex is primarily heterosexual, it's vaginal, um, hence the, uh, we're supposed to be shocked um, at BDSM or, or anal sex. Um, it's productive sex that produces um, family tickets, um, family bags of crisps, uh, seats for couples and moral order. So I'd agree uh, with Ella um, that uh, a lot of talk about sex in this apparently age of greater freedom is um, curiously, or perhaps not, um, extremely moralistic and prescriptive. And yes, that it impacts on women um, whose sexuality, as she said, has always been policed, um, and, and on queers and on anybody who doesn't uh, fit this uh, deification of the dyad, the, the, you know, the, the holy couple. And that's not new, as Olivia pointed out, um, with the Victorian prescription for large families. And it doesn't matter which side of the, victor of the uh, political spectrum you're on either. So even Shelley, um, that great radical and um, you know, referred a great deal to by uh, New Labour, um, who was an atheist, a vegetarian, a propagator of unmarried love, even he and his beautiful uh, poem, Love's Philosophy, um, she presents this sort of holistic model of stability where the waves clasp one another, the mountains clasp one another, um, each, you know, each sister flower should most definitely um, kiss her brother, no, no, no worries about um, Ella's point about consent. Um, what is all this sweet work worth? if thou kiss not me. Um, so even radicals are interested in the work of policing sex, um, of stabilizing it. Um, um, so, 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 so in short, obviously not the right, I uh, know to the idea of the right type. Um, what I find more interesting um, is uh, sex that is, uh, or, or rather an experience of sex, the allowance of the experience of sex, that might be imaginative, that might be malleable according to your environment, according to um, moments in your life. And we know this from the studies of people like Dr. Lisa Richmond, who coined the term female sexual fluidity uh, sort of back in 2000s, and in the last decade has been mapping male sexual fluidity as well. Um, I'm also interested in sex that disrupts this exhausting vision of the so-called sex life. I mean, what, you know, what the hell's a sex life? It's like the sex life. Uh, you're going to do it with this one person. You're on this train now and you're gonna do it in this particular way because it's a life. Life has a journey. Life has got to have a meaning. And um, you're on this train until it crashes through just you know, death or unsustainability. Um, so I'm much more interested in love that is not necessarily productive, but that expands our erotic imagination. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.